ladies and gentlemen, welcome to NJPW Puro Wrestler Review. I am your co-host, Andre Shee. Right over here, it's the effervescent Mel Ball. How you doing, Mel Ball? I am doing great, Andre. It's been a gloriously chaotic day today. I mean, it is a it is a Tuesday, isn't it? No, it's a Wednesday. Even better. Ah, oh, I got up. It was great. I was excited. Had a good breakfast. The dog finally went outside. The first time in like almost a week because of our frigid weather here. Mm. Great thing about having a chihuahua. I got to the gym. My headphones went kaplut. <laughs> I got to spend two hours listening to the grunts and grams and giggity got gig gookins of the people around <laughs> me. <sighs> but you know, I had a great leg day despite that. Despite dancing to the songs of the grunts beside me, I had a great leg day. And then I went to go home and she breaks a nail. It's one of those days, my friend. Can't have the good without the bad. But hey, we're still trucking. At least mm -hmm. I can see the cute puppies in their coats walking in front of me while we're doing this. Well, How are you, you doing today? I'm good. I got a workout in, getting all buff and stuff, you know, getting all healthy and got to work out again tomorrow with my trainer, Rich, Rich King, the man, the myth, the legend here in Alberta professional wrestling. I'm working out with him tomorrow. So, yeah, a lot, lot of apparently spring in his boots. Yeah. So I'm working out uh, just on a couple days off here, just, you know, trying to take it kind of easy while still getting stuff done, you know. <laughs> Yeah. Easier said than done. Always. Got a, I got a busy next like week and a half, or next week ahead of me because like I go back to work. I work Friday, Saturday. I'm hanging out with you at, at a, a wrestling hockey game. And then I work again. Then I'm going to wrestling again. And then I finally get a weekend off. It's, it's going to be – I'm busy. Lots of wrestling. We can't complain about that, can we? No, no. not at all. Never. Never. But uh, we're going to get into this. But before we get into it, I want to thank each and every one of you guys. We appreciate all this great support. Uh, if you could please keep uh, liking the video, subscribing to the channel, commenting down below. Um, don't forget to hit uh, sharing us out. Don't forget to hit that notification bell wherever uh, on on the YouTube channel so you can be alerted every time we drop a new video. Ding dong. I'm going to answer it today. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> who is there <laughs> but yeah um and also want to if you were listening on sunday night's main event radio please uh subscribe to the channel and go over to the to the uh, patreon page and give that the patreon a follow lots of great new content can be coming out over there um so before we get into battle in the valley which we're here to talk about um, I do want because as we record this, it's Wednesday, uh, January 17th, 2024. Um, it is the one year since uh, Jay Briscoe's passed. Uh, I just want to uh, just say uh, we that I, I absolutely love that guy, especially did former IWGP uh, tag team champion. So I just want to give him a shout out to the man. We miss you, uh, miss watching you in professional wrestling because you and your brother were an amazing tag team, and uh, your singles run alone was incredible. The single run alone was incredible. So I just want to give a shout out to him on the anniversary of his passing. Yeah, I was seeing that online today. Very sad. Very sad. Mm -hmm. um, definitely missing seeing some faces in professional wrestling, and his is one of them. It wasn't the they weren't the top team on my list, but they were always a team that you knew would be entertaining to watch. I used to call them the Hillbilly Ninjas. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, it, it, the red, they did Redneck Karate, as I think it was called. So, yeah, a lot of good stuff. So, uh, shout out to the, to the wonderful Jay Briscoe. Uh, rest in peace, my friend. But. We're here to talk some New Japan. So we're going to get into it. We're going to talk a battle in the Valley from this past weekend. I know we're a few days removed uh, from battle in the Valley on the 13th. It's now the 17th, but life has just been busy. Uh, I haven't been able to get around to recording till now. So we're going to talk battle in the Valley. Uh, I thought absolutely tremendous show. The crowd 
from even when the crowd was filing in during the pre-show, I think was it was they were very loud throughout the night, and they only ramped up into that insanely loud crowd in the main event. <laughs> Holy shit! Yeah, yeah. A- anything out of Japan is kind of known for just being louder. We're used to to our quiet Japan crowds, but then we get something like in the U.S. or something in the U.K. The U.K. especially is usually very loud with their songs. I love it. We even got some songs on this one too, though. Very, very fun. Yeah, this crowd was absolute fire. Yeah, again, incredible crowd, and I really, really did enjoy hearing them tonight. So we're going to get into it, kick it off on the pre-show with a strong survivor match. You have the aerial chemist, Matt Vandegrift, taking on the golden era, Goldie. Um, Matt? Kind of came out kind of dressed down comparatively to the last couple of times I've seen him. Didn't have his goggles and his top hat and his big jacket, just wearing his Ninja Camp Academy shirt. And he's got black tights with the pink uh, accented knee pads and uh, kick pads look good. Uh, Goldie coming up with his black and gold gear as always. Cause he's Goldie. Um, also, Vandegriff um, missing his trademark beard there. Um, and that really changed the look for me because there were points in the, the match where I was like, wait, who is that again? Oh, right, it's Vandergriff. He just looked very, very different to me. A Goldie kind of just, I'm not going to lie. I, at first, I thought it was Callum. I thought it was mm-hmm. Callum. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, again, very similar look between Callum and Goldie. And I, I think Vandergriff looked like it, it aged him down a good bit, taking the beard off. And it kind of weird because, and if you're looking, watching the guys he wrestling, I'm like, oh, he's going to have problems in a year or two. Because if you look at his hair, the top's already, you can already see the top of his hair starting to thin out. I, we, I've watched it happen with Michael Richard plays here in Edmonton, the man who, who learned to cut his hair because it, stuff thins out over the years. <laughs> but you know. You know the power of the bald spot. We Larry. know the power. Fucking Larry. <laughs> Fucking Larry. Power of the bald spot. And apparently his bald spot got beat up this weekend. Not <laughs> enough to lose that title, but I digress. Back to this. All right. So good wrestling back and forth. They're working on each other's arms early. Matt's doing some flips and some arm drags. Uh, Matt sends Goldie over the top to the apron. And he does this like flip over the rope and like roll, like comes up, like landing on his back on the apron and like up kicks Goldie off the apron. I was like, that was cool. Uh, really different. Um, Matt's on the apron. Goldie sweep does that leg that grabs the leg and sweeps him out. But Matt f- does a full front flip over and landing on the on the apron. Beautiful tilt to world backbreaker by Goldie for two, and then follows it up with a neck breaker, whipping him hard into the corner and then like stamping on his face. Matt's just, or Goldie's just working this kid over. Um, Matt gets Goldie into the corner and hits a beautiful tag or faint kick through the ro- through the ropes and into the corner. Um, Bridging Fisherman Suplex by Goldie for two. Uh, Goldie throwing kicks to Matt. Goldie slapping, just starts slapping him. But Matt stands up, strikes, but then Goldie hits this, like, like almost like a crescent kick to the head. Um, uh, Goldie goes for the Ushiguroshi, but Matt flips out, hits an Enziguri, picks him up. I'm thinking he's going for a fallaway slam or something. I'm, like, holding him up, and then he just kind of, like, spins him down, and he just drops him. I was like... It, 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 to me, I'm like, oh, he's doing a Wade Barrett. Because, like, all I could think of was the wasteland where he Barrett had him on his shoulders, and he just, like, roll him forward and, like, throw him down. And it looks so ineffective. I was just like, okay. And then he went up to the top, hits his 450, and gets the win. I'm just – and, again, I am not a professional wrestler. But as a fan, you got to give a little more oomph to when you're going to – when you go to slam the guy down. Because it did, it just looked like you had him up in the air, and then you just went and you kind of rolled him down and dropped him. Like that's all I. That's my only criticism of this entire match is that move needs a little more oomph. <laughs> but Matt Vandergrift gets the win in the longest strong survivor match at six minutes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I do have to agree. I I actually kind of liked that little spin thing, but it does need. A little bit more power because like I know it's a setup to the finish but it like in my head it's like Goldie wouldn't have laid there that long because 
the, the bump wasn't that bad. So yeah, no, I, I agree. It could use some more oomph, but I do like how it's an interesting feed into the 450 because we do see um, some people doing a little bit more aerials now. Vikingo, I mean, how do you even begin to try to compete with the uniqueness that that man has? Something like this can start to set you apart um, from that. And I kind of liked it, his little touch of flair, if you will. But yeah, definitely does need a little bit more pizzazz in it. Um, the tiger thing that you said in the corner, is that that little flippy dippy thing that fed into that almost 619 looking thing? Uh, yeah, like... Because like there was there's two corner spots because there's the one where he sent Goldie over and just rolled over the ropes and landed on his back and up kicked him. And then there was later on the match he did this like flip into the corner. Goldie ended up going face first in the corner and they flipped over the top into the tiger fan kick. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was wondering because like it wasn't like a, he was taking this like a, doing a six one nine with the feet. He like folded in his knees and and he gave him his shins essentially, which I really really liked. I thought it looked really really cool. Um, Vandergriff has a very unique in-ring kind of style that I would actually compare a little bit to Suji um, in that regard. They've got that combination of aerialism and power wrestling, but he can probably, I think we, I feel like we have seen him transition into a few submissions in the past. Um, what else? What else? Yeah, that 450 for the, uh, the win, I thought super impressive. Again, with the little follow-up thing, kind of did set him apart from Goldie. Um, Goldie's going to be an interesting one. Um, he he has this, like, persona in the ring that is, like, unlockable. You know what I mean? Like, he starts off and he's kind of, like, he's kind of there. And as he gets madder or more emotional throughout the match, you start to see a little bit more of that personality and charisma start to come out i think once he unlocks it a little bit quicker um he's gonna see a, a little bit more up there but otherwise i thought this was a very very solid match from from two people coming out of that dojo yeah again this is it's it's all about the cat the new japan academy here it's all about showcasing what the future of new Japan is going to be. And again, both these guys are building up. I've seen, we've seen Goldie before. It was a few shows, like a few strong shows ago. He, he worked the pre-show and won the strong survivor match. And then Matt Banneker's worked won those last two. He's three in a row now. And we're going to keep seeing him on strong shows. Like he'll be at Windy City Riot. I guarantee you he'll be on the pre-show for Windy City Riot. And I'm actually really looking forward to seeing him again and seeing who they put him in there with. I just hope he grows the beard back. <laughs> Me too. Excuse me. Uh, we're going to move on to the uh, the other match on the pre-show. It is Aviva Van taking on Stephanie Vecchier. I think I said it right. Vecchier. Vecchier. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm white. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Bruh. <laughs> I know, but like, I'm very white. I know Andreas was schooling us on the name, but I'm still insanely white, and I can't I'm, I don't do foreign names super well. You have heard me on That's this show. <laughs> you, you've heard me on this show millions of times. I am not good at names. <laughs> you, you have to teach me uh, Wakaskiyama's name. <laughs> what, what's going to be funny is that every, at some point in time in our journey on this, she's going to become a more regular thing for you to say, and we're just going to have you recording it, saying it properly one time, and then you can mess it up infinitely. And we'll just have the audio just viaquier over top of when you butcher it. Oh, oh Jesus. Come on. Oh, you're mean. Stephanie Vecchier. Um, Vendetta, or uh, Viva Vangesta, Vendetta, which is a wheel kick for two count hits. Uh, Vecchier gets the uh, 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 Suzuki like, uh, Minoru Suzuki like arm bar over the rope. Um, boot wash in the corner by Vecchier. Uh, and the inverted head scissors slams and starts slamming the face down to the mat. Gets a two count. Skull on skull head, but just gross. Um, that was this wouldn't be the last one of the night. I can tell you that for sure. He's not even the last one in this match. Um, sick ass dragon screw out of the corner by Fikia. Um, 
Viva Van uh, with the kicks and, and sweeps the legs. Hits this running Meteora for two. High cross by Viva. But Vaquera rolls it through into a pin for two. Then transition into the cross phase. But Viva gets to the ropes. Viva Van gets Tarantula on the ropes. Uh, Vaquera hits this like weird looking DDT. I don't know if it was fully like she got her went back, but it, it didn't look right. And she get she pulls it into a roll up for two. Vaquera going back to the head butts in the corner. Uh, hits a corner meteora. Then the package backbreaker, which I when she hit that package backbreaker at the end for the win, I was like, damn. She hooks it up like a package pile driver. And then picks it up and spins it out and drops the person onto the knee. That was cool. I really liked that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So what I'm telling you. These lucha girls, they're dangerous. Um, that meteor in the corner. Ooh, 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 ooh. She bounced off of that turnbuckle. She hit that girl so hard. Gosh dang. Um Going back to the beginning, though, um, Viva Van's robe was gorgeous. I loved her entry uh, robe. She looks so good. Her gear looks so good. I really liked how she looked. Um, Vaquier, though, coming in with the horns and the robe, very cold, very villain-esque, and I loved it. Um, with that little touch of red in her outfit, kind of is something a little different. I'm used to seeing her in more um, a solid black, so I, I was really happy to see that um, little splash of color. Her attitude, very fiery in this one, but still very calm. At no point did she seem flustered or angry or over-emotional. She was very stoic in this match. Really, really enjoyed that. Um, the series of reversals that these women were doing at the beginning there, where it was just like, trying to get into a move but the other just denying them over and over and over again it was like i don't want to say a dance but it was almost essentially like they were doing a little dance and i really enjoyed it um just showing off how smart and intelligent these girls are with that technicality um what else what else that thing where you said she was slamming her head into the ground i think it was called a skull crusher that's what the, I was listening to the Japanese commentary as opposed to the English one on this one because for whatever reason my fight wouldn't log on to the television. So we watched it on NJPW and we watched it in Japanese and that was what he was screaming at that point. Skull crusher. I was like, okay, that's a sure. Part. It looks like a Brazilian lap dance to me almost, but like not quite as happy ending. Um yeah, I, I really liked the Skull Crushers because they were different from the Brazilian lap dance that we're used to seeing from Taguchi in that they were legitimately effective. <laughs> Whereas like the Brazilian lap dance is just kind of embarrassing. I don't know that it's actually damaging anything other than your pride. Um, yeah, this was a very, very fun match. And I think another you know, kind of step for Bacchieri in really getting a solid foot in the North American kind of market. I'm very excited to see what we have next for her because she's challenged for the strong title now twice, isn't it? Once directly and once in the tournament kind of well, thing, right? Yeah, and this was a eliminator match for another shot at the title. I mean, third time's the charm, right, girl? I mean, let's give her. Because what a better representation for the strong brand in North America than Stephanie Bacchier. Well, and my thinking of this is Fantastica Mania is in February. She is CMLL. So why I not was send... telling you that that would be a fantastic idea. Just bring her over to stardom for that time. Have, Please well, do. Not not even that. You could have Julia versus Stephanie Vaquer on one of the Fantastica Mania shows. Maybe on like the final night of Fantastica Mania, on the big final night, do Stephanie Vaquer versus Julia for the strong title. That would be... I think that would work. Hell yeah. Heck yeah, that would work. That would be freaking fantastic. I still think it would be really, really awesome to start setting up the same kind of um, Fantastica Mania thing, not just with NJPW, but with Stardom as well. 
start mm-hmm. bringing over some of the, the um, CMLL ladies, mixing them up with some of the stardom ladies, maybe we can start seeing some of the stardom ladies going over to CMLL, training that, with some of the girls there. That'd be an incredible experience for both companies. Imagine Luca Lucha Waka. <laughs> that would be awesome. Could you imagine? <laughs> Oh my god, that would be incredible. Yeah, it would be. So we're going to move on. We're going to get to the first match of the actual pay-per-view, and it is a six-person tag match. Fred Rosser, Jacob Fatu, and Shota Umino uh, team, taking on Team Filthy, Jarrell Nelson, Royce Isaacs, and Tom Lawler. Uh, if you didn't know, Jacob Fatu is from MLW. Family ties to Roman Reigns, the Usos, and The Rock. So he's part of that Samoan dynasty line there um yeah i took a lot of notes in this match where i realized i don't really need that many notes for this match um i pretty much wrote down everything a roster and lawler they've been having a a a pretty big feud over the last few years of of strong and it seems to come to a head like it's almost turned into a respect battle versus actually hating on each other more or less in my personal opinion I think that's where we've I, gone to. I would have to agree, yeah, yeah. Because before we would see Team Filthy being filthy and just beating up on people and whatever. Now we see handshakes being done by um, Tom and and Fred Rosser. Seems to be a little bit of a um, causing some tensions though with the rest of uh, Team Filthy. Well, throughout the match, uh, like Isaacs and and uh, Nelson were trying to do dirty play dirty tactics in the match but especially when it was against a rosser they they tended to lawler tended to be very much like no 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 it is how i felt um fat two in here man when he came in the crowd went nuts for him they were into this dude man like they were into this dude man coming in um Takes everyone out, hits a suicide dive onto Nelson on the floor. And that Fosbury flop to Lawler and Isaacs on the other side. Uh, hits a swanton and a handspring moonsault to Lawler for two. Uh, dude, he was so, like, just this dude. Like, I haven't watched a lot of women in MLW, but what I've watched, I've been impressed and just more impressive. And him and Lawler had a feud in, M- in MLW, too. So they're very familiar with each other, man. Uh, a lot of West Coast Wrecking Crew double teams in this match. Um, like they double team Umino and Nelson. Then Nelson hits his just rough looking pounce to Umino, dude. Just sending him across the ring. Crazy. The team filthy do hit the triple power bomb. Uh, Lawler gets in on the triple team. Uh, they do it to Umino, so he didn't seem to be as much caring about triple teaming Umino as much more than Nelson or than uh Rosser, but yeah. Uh, but really yeah. good, yeah. Um, I am ending comes, uh, Isaac's and Umino trade Isaac's and Umino trading finisher reversals. Uh, they trade strikes. Umino hits that pop up uppercut, hits the blaze blade thief, and then hits the death rider for the win. Listen to guys entire gimmick is I'm a thief. I'm stealing from everybody else. So yeah. Um, so roster offers a handshake to Lawler after the match, but Nelson pushes Lawler away saying, no, 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 no. But Lawler fights through his boys and shakes roster's hand or slaps roster in the face. Roster slaps him back. Then they shake hands and then they, and then roster and his, and leaves and his boys follow him out. So the crowd's chanting and cheering. Everybody's leaving. And it's when I was leaving a mask guy pops out of the crowd Beats him up, and even like a couple security guards jumped on him too, which I really like seeing because in wrestling, when a guy jumps out of the crowd and the security does nothing, you're like, "Fuck you!" But this one actually, the security grabs him at first, but then he pulls them, then he pulls the mask off, and it's Jack Perry from AEW. I was slightly underwhelmed, but he's not like he's attacking Osprey after a match; he's attacking Umino, so he. Gets in the ring, uh, or he does a bar- the barricade hung DDT, uh, hits a flying knee in the ring, dropping Umino, stands over him, pulls a con- is a- an AEW contract out, rips it up, um, and puts on an armband which says scapegoat on it. Crowds booze him, and that was it. Now, again, I'm 
I'm interested in seeing what Perry does, but I'm not excited for the, the, the guy to be here. But if they do the right, if Kittle does a good storyline, I'm down. The guy's a good professional wrestler. I'm going to talk about the match first, and then I'm going to complain about this. Mm-hmm. Um, there was um, the beginning of the match when Rosser was in there with Jarrell Nelson. I don't know. Part of it just felt awkward, almost like they didn't know what they were doing mm-hmm. together. There was kind of like a lot of like weird handsy stuff going on where they were trying to grab onto each other, but mm-hmm. they weren't supposed to be doing that yet or something. It just kind of felt awkward to me. Uh, maybe it just has to do with the tension that's happening between him and, and all of Team Filthy. I don't know. Um, it just felt a little awkward. Um, yeah, but you're absolutely right, Fatu. Just, the crowd erupted, and holy heck, did he come in like a wrecking ball. Um, he was kind of like the silent star of this match. Because whenever he stepped in there, all attention was on him. But even when he was like not in the ring... It was impossible to not pay attention to what it was that he was kind of doing. He was always kind of doing something. Um, what else? Lots of chaos in Team Filthy right now. Um, going to be interesting to see how much longer they fly the banner of Team Filthy and if West Coast Wrecking Crew will stay there and whatever will happen to Mr. Limelight or whatever. Not that I care. But... <laughs> Whatever happens to him, I mean, still a decent junior wrestler. Um, yeah, interesting to see how this story with, with these guys and like Team Filthy and, and Rosser kind of progresses. Um, yeah, Shota, I'm not going to lie, like there was one point I actually forgot Shota was in the match. Mm-hmm. And when he showed up to do the end, I was like, oh, right, you're here. Okay. That's why okay. the intro was so long. Um, but yeah. Kind of like, oh, okay, the little hidden blade. Yeah, I got that. Heard your little, heard your little thing under there. And you're right, he is a thief. Who is Shota Umino? Does Shota Umino even know who Shota Umino is? His hairstyle is like Naito. His outfit is like Tanahashi. He wrestles like John Moxley, and now he's stealing people's moves. Hmm? Bruh. You are not an amoeba thing or a single cell organism that you you would attach yourself to someone and then you just suck out the good spots of them. Who is Shota Umino? We, I don't feel that we know. So this brings me to Mr. Perry. Why are we debuting a guy who had the most underwhelming personality and least amount of charisma on one of the biggest companies that he had the opportunity to why are we debuting that then de- mama jamma against our version of said underwhelming lack of personality and charisma mama jamma? There's nothing for them to leech off of to make the thing better. That's how these two are able to be where they were in the companies that they were in. So why are we doing? But I'm not going to be that bitch. I'm going to be that supportive lady. And I'm going to say, you know what? Gato did a good thing last year with the War Dogs. He really built those guys up. He told a really great story. We were a little concerned about that story too when it started. And look how it kind of went out. I'm going to have faith. But yeah, the, the debut did not. He came out and I was like, oh, great. Another one. If we were doing a tradesies with with AEW, would not have been even in a top 10 of what I would have wanted for an exchange. But this is what we get. And I'm going to hope that some of those acting chops can pop out of Mr. Perry there. That's that's in your lineage. Let's let's see some of it. Yeah, I, I get that. And but remember, Gato has a pensity for booking people with zero charisma into a world title. So yeah, I'm not surprised. <laughs> he has a tendency, but it's not foolproof. I mean, we got Sonata. Yeah, who's has a zero charisma. 
Um, great professional wrestler, zero, dude. And when he wait, was it last was a forbidden door. It was him and Jack Perry. I the match itself was like technically really good, but I was super bored during that match because neither man. That was a black hole of charisma match, and I as much I know there's a lot of Sonata supporters out there. I think the man is an incredible professional wrestler, but he's got like very little charisma. Jack Perry, I'm sorry, you do not have your dad's acting chops. I'm glad you're a good professional wrestler because you do not have the acting chops of your father. Yeah, the beard make you made you look a lot more like your dad, but yeah, still like I'm I'm hoping Gato can get something out of him having him work in New Japan personally, but I'm hoping it's not just a New Japan strong thing where next time we see him is in three months at Windy City Riot. This needs to go to come over to Japan. If it's going to happen, they need to build him in Japan, in my personal opinion. Well, yeah, that's the only way it's going to work. But that being said, though, we've been trying to build this Mama Jamma in Japan, too. And Shota, it just, he's got the personality of a salt-free soda cracker, man. It's just so dry, not palatable. You eat it when your stomach's upset. Like, that's, yeah. yeah. I, I'm going to hope that they do something good with it and that they can figure something out with this. But typically, like, with Shota, he needs somebody to, to leech that personality off of to feel comfortable being more than he is. And I feel like Perry is the same way based on the very little amount of things that I have seen of him in AEW. My concern is getting those two in the ring and them not having anything to do and us having that Sonata Perry 2.0 and having months of it, not just a one-off match, having months of it, that is a concern. But I'm going to hope Gato fix it. Yeah, hopefully Gato can get something out of both of these guys. Umino, I think, is the lost cause at this point, um, personally, because he's been being booked by Gato forever, and they just, like I still... I see, I see sparks of it every now and again, but then he just falls apart. And this whole, and now he's dealing with Narita, and now he's dealing with Perry. Does Perry end up a, as a torture as a member of the of the House of Torture? That's the other question. Like, just like I don't know, and it just I don't I don't know. Y'all just, just gave me a heart attack with that one. Just come on, you can't. How do you make the worst thing worser? It can be House of Perry. <laughs> Not even the good Perry either. <laughs> oh, wish there was Make a platypus. I wish there was a platypus. We move on. <laughs> Please tell me you don't understand what I'm talking about with the platypus. <laughs> Perry the platypus. <laughs> oh, Melba's lost. Uh, we move on. It's it's lucha time, baby. Rocky Romero and Soberano Jr. taking on Mascara Dorada and uh, Valadar Jr. Um, the original Mascara Dorada, by the way. Um, no, sorry, this is not. No, this is not the original. This is the second Mascara Dorada. I'm pretty sure this is not the original. The OG is Grand Metal League. This is the the newer version that took over the gimmick when he went to WWE. Um, I was very confused with Soberano fighting with Volador and like attacking him into Volador's own corner. And then like Dorada just like standing there, letting him beat on his partner instead of tagging in. I'm like, what? Uh, this is a very Lucha inspired match though. And that's what they do. Yeah. But it makes no sense. Um, I lots didn't of say flip. it did. That's just what they do. <laughs> Yeah, lots of flips, lots of kicks. Soberana trying to heal it up as best he can, doing a terrible job at it, in my opinion. Um, the only good heel in this match was Rocky Romero. Soberano's way better as a face when he was working with Atlantis during the tag the tag league. He's not a good heel, man. I'm sorry. I yeah. Um Volador, though, that like the, the flips, man. He, he had this handspring flip, looked so good. Um Volador and Dorada hitting dual suicide dives to the floor. Uh, Rocky gets the one ever, two ever, three ever, but that does not get the four ever clothesline. But he does get the rewind kick for two. 
Uh, Rocky flips out of a power bomb, hits the dude buster to Volador Jr. Uh, Silverano hits the the Giselle Shaw spinning the spinning dive off the top. Um, uh, and then he hits an up kick uh, to a moonsaulting Dorada. Um, uh, electric chair flip into a neck breaker by Dorada to Soberana Jr. Looked absolutely tremendous. Um, Soberano uh, blesses Dorada, but he fights off uh, Rocky. Uh, Dorada fights off Rocky, hits a head scissors to Soberano, dodges to Rocky, Romero sent on, and hits a toe bait to Soberano on the floor. Vol- Volador Jr. and hits the Canadian destroyer to Rocky, Romero, and Volador gets the win. This Canadian destroyer looks like a finisher. Pointing that out. I like that he made it a very authoritative finish as well. Um, what to say? Oh, um, Sobrano Jr.'s mask. Very Black Tiger inspired. I loved it. I thought it was cool. Um, I like the the heel Sobrano, but I also tend to like the goofier heels a little bit because he's he's doing the goofy heel thing where he's wearing the faux fur jacket and he's kind of acting like a dick and laughing about it. He's he's acting like a bro. He's acting like a club bro. And you don't, I don't think I've seen that a lot in the Mexican like CMLL AAA kind of thing. So I, I actually really enjoy it. Because um, he also has been playing to the crowd a lot more as a heel than he did as a face. So I really did enjoy his interaction in this match as well. Um, Mascadora, so freaking quick, like deceptively quick. Um, He and the way he just moves, it gets close to that Vikingo kind of speed and agility and ability to just whoop de whoop into something. And sometimes it just happens so quickly. That he wasn't, uh, he or someone else wasn't prepared for it. And sometimes you overspin something. I, I noticed it happen a few times, but he could just catch back on with his feet so quickly and just complete whatever it was that he was doing. I appreciated it so much. Um, the teams, I felt, both worked very, very well together, very fluidly. Um, together throughout this entire match. I really liked how the kind of, it was very obvious which ones the heels were and which ones the faces were. And they interacted very over the top appropriately to create a very fun and interesting story that I honestly wasn't aware of going. I know there's like ish going on between Volador and Rocky, but I didn't know how Dorada or Soberano fit into that. And they created this really fun bad guy, good guy, story kind of on the fly seemingly um in this show which i really really enjoyed um but yeah i really enjoy i've always enjoyed volador jr and his style that canadian destroyer just boom at the end there just perfect way to end that match yeah i like that you do uh we're gonna move on it's t a j p versus the new NJP or IWGP Global Heavyweight Champion David Finley in a non-title bout. Um, I gotta say, TJP's theme song it's a goddamn banger, like so good. Uh, David Finley's regular theme don't it's it's fine, but his War Dogs theme is just straight up fire. Like I'd rather him just come up to the War Dogs theme all the time. Uh, Veda says that TJP does plan to kind of step up as a leader. Uh, for United Empire after Osprey heads to AEW, which I, I like to hear. It's, it's they, they're gonna need a leader. Um, TJP attacks Finley on the floor, runs in the barricade, hits a wrecking ball drop kick. Um, uh, he chokes Finley with the shirt. They brawl. Finley ends up suplexing TJP on the ramp. Uh, I think it was I can't remember, one of them said uh, TJP faced actually faced uh, David Finley's little brother Brogan back in 2022 on Strong. Before Brogan signed with WWE. So, yeah, um, this Brogan was another one who was NJPW trained and left for WWE, uh, just like that a hole Carl Fredericks uh, leaving the NJPW, didn't give him, didn't give him his career. 
Bastard. Hey, Bastard. We do not talk negatively about the alpha. I do. <laughs> Screw Rude. that guy. Screw Rude. that guy. Screw Rude. that guy. He, he, ab he abandoned those who trained him. Just like Brody. Oh, Zingin went at the same time, my guy. What do you mean? He went with that group too. Alex Zane left and JPW. Same with Blake Christensen. Remember that weirdo who did the Captain Morgan? Zane? That Zane, whole group? Zane, he was with that whole group? Zane was there. Zane came back to AEW or to, to WWE or to NJPW. Back, but he left. Yeah, but Carl Fredericks abandoned them. Zane, Zane was never gone, gone. Come on, we know that. He was on <laughs> NXT a couple of times. That, that was as like an enhancement talent. Everybody's worked at NXT as an enhancement. He never went to WWE like like Carl did, the jerk. Uh, Finley uh, whips you TJP into the corner. over there, my friend. Finley whips TJP into the corner. Flip, uh, TJP flips like a flipping over the top, falling to the floor. He's beaten up on uh, Finley, beaten up on TJP. Comes back, but TJP comes back and snaps the arm Fujiwara style. Hot shots the arm on the rope, hits a Mamba splash to the floor. He hangs Finley up on the ropes, hits a Mamba Splash on the ropes, hits a Tornado DDT, gets a lace wash and running boot in the corner a couple times. Uh, Finley ends up getting like a deep, uh, the Baron Corbin deep six uh, to TJP as he's coming one for the running knee, um, and then hits a harsh Irish curse backbreaker for two, hits another super Irish curse backbreaker on the Dominator for two. Gets the Shillelagh, he's taken away. TJP misses him in the face, hits the running knee for two, then a Mamba Splash for two. Uh, Finley hits this sick looking pile driver to TJP who kicks out a 2.9. He then hits, picks him up, hits this modified version. Like he lifts him up for the trash pan, but he's bringing him down. He just lifts his knee up to crash it, like crack him in the knee. Like he didn't drop him down on it. He lifted his knee up into it, um, for the trash pan into oblivion and he gets the win. My favorite, I'm sorry, this match was really good. But my favorite part was after the match. Where Finley is getting in a fan's face, and then another fan's holding up his his world title, and Finley like because Finley's holding the belt up at this other dude, and Finley grabs this guy's world title and whips it across to the other side of the ring, like into the crowd on the other side. <laughs> I was like, "Oh, well, you just wasted fucking four hundred dollars, buddy, <laughs> or more." Like Jesus. Yeah. Not only that, but like, who caught it? Where'd it go? That's did they question. get their hands up, or did somebody just get pitch slapped by a world title? <laughs> oh dear! Life choices were made, and you know, yep. Let's just say, like, it's what a heel would do. And it works so perfectly to this persona. I, I had, um, I got like really giddy when I saw this match. Because this, if you remember, was my choice for Super uh, Junior of the Year last year, TJP. And my choice for wrestler to look out for this year, David Finley. Holy hot dang. Um, the red mist by TJP was perfection. And it, it ended up flowing so perfectly and nicely together um yeah this match was a great back and forth between the two of them and it was really even like usually with njpw matches there's a template where you can see who's dominating early in the match you can usually figure out who's going to win this match didn't have that it was tj got the the drop on finley kicked his ass for a bit and then Finley figured it out, turned around, and started kicking TJP's ass for a little bit. It was very, is he going to get it or is he going to get it? Is he going to get it or is he going to get it? Literally to the last little bit, I was confused. I didn't know. I had no idea who's going to win it. But when you look at the paper and know that even though TJP is the IWGP junior tag team champion, Finley is... He's a global champion. It's it's above the the junior tag division, unfortunately. Um, but man, did was this fight? Because it was just a fight at one point. I mean, TJP was just mm -hmm. throwing feet every which way he can, getting not one but two face 
face washes mm -hmm. from TJP. And he's a man of the people, Mr. TJP. He's a perfect leader. The crowd was asking for another face wash. He gave us a face wash. He is a kind God. I, I accept TJP as our Lord and ruler for the, the empire. I, I can deal with that. I think it's actually the best decision they can make. The amount of experience that this guy has mm -hmm. can only push him to the top. It's true. Very true. We move on. Strong open weight tag team championships. It's the Gorillas of Destiny defending their titles against the Bullet Club War Dogs team of Alice Coughlin and Clark Connors. Remember, this is the strong open weight tag team titles. So remember, this is the open weight. So we have the junior and the heavyweight coming together in this match. Uh, War Dogs attack for the bell. Jody fight him off. Connors ends up chop blocking the knee of Hikuleo. Coglin grab pulls Hikuleo in onto the apron and wraps the knee around the post a couple times. They spend the next couple few minutes uh, working over the knee of Hikuleo. They're beating up him up in the corner. ELP gets in, hits a springboard cross in the line, salt to Coglin in the ring, hits a tornado DDT off the apron to Connors on the floor. Springboard tornado DDT in the ring, back of the ring to Oz Coglin. And, and him and Hickle, they hit the UFO big boot combo for a two count. Uh, Coglin uh, gets a huge German to Hickle, and then hits the Dreadnought Driver, which I was like, that's awesome, um, to Hickle, uh, Connors hits the spear, and the dogs hit the hit and run, which is the high-low for a two count. Uh, sandwich forearms by the War Dogs and the assisted Brain Buster, but again, only two. Uh, full clip is hit on to Hickle, but the pin gets broken up. ELP kicks Connors off the when he's up top. He kicks him off the top. Coggin gets hit with and Coggin gets a power gets power slam, choke slam by Hikuleo, and the super thunder kiss 86. And the champs retain their titles in 12 minutes and 16 seconds. Yeah, yeah, this was a fun one. I'm a I'm a beat that I'm a be that girl. I felt that this was a really great match for in-ring performance for the War Dogs, but their gear was depressingly underwhelming. We're in jeans. It, it, yeah. I mean, I did not mean the, I did not not like the ripped pants that Connors was wearing. I would personally wear a pair of those myself, but the boots that he was wearing, the cowboy boot inspired looking things. Hmm made him look like he was wearing canoes they just did not look like they fit properly they may have but they did not look like they did and it kind of looked cheap looked ridiculous and then and then there was Coglin, who is already a confusing member for me because he like unquestionably fits in this faction he is power he is dominant, and he has that resting bitch face that just makes him so <laughs> intimidating. It's it's he's a perfect intimidation person, but like wearing just black jeans and not even black boots. He was wearing those like slate gray blue looking suede things that again did not look like they fit his feet properly. He just these two. I don't want to say clowns because they didn't look like clowns, but they looked like emo clowns. I did not like the outfits. They did not look professional. And then we see them later in the night wearing pretty much the same damn thing and just adding a t-shirt, and it looked so much better. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. It. I would like to see them. I would have liked to see. Connors in his regular gear, his regular, you know, hundred proof gear that he wore with Trilla Maloney. That stuff looks great. Probably would have looked even better because he's so freaking cut right now. Both of these guys. Um, but yeah, and same even with Coglin, just would have liked to see him in his just regular black trunks. I, I did not like the look of this. They, they kind of just looked like. Some guys they pulled off the street. But the match itself was so damn good. Mm -hmm. I don't understand it. Yeah. However. Yeah. That's yeah. all I have. <laughs> okay. I, you said however, so I assumed you were about to say something else. So I was like, what? Okay. 
Yeah, again, really, I thought really good match. This match was as long, was long, was was it longer, or as long as these teams got, or longer than God got facing Bishamon at Wrestle Kingdom. Yeah, that makes sense. If I'm being honest, I enjoyed this match more than I enjoyed Bishamon and. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, like I did not enjoy the Wrestle Kingdom matches nearly as much as this one. Mm. But Bishimon looked professional, minus Yoshihashi's oversized intro gear. Uh, I, hate, I hate that gear. Me too. We move on. It's the strong women's championship. Julia defending against uh, NJBW Academies and ROH in AEW. She's appeared on them all. Trish Adora. Adora comes out. She has Charlie Bravado. And as I knew him in AEW, the captain, Sean Dean, coming out with her. It kind of gave her, 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 instead of her just coming out on her own, to a crowd that may not be as familiar with her, maybe a pay-per-view audience that hasn't watched a lot of her, um, gave her something. To her because she came in with her boys, they were they were getting all hype around her. She's coming, they coming out and get, they got to the ring, and then they fucked off to the back. They fucked off right after she got to the ring. It was that was, but it gave her that something as she coming out, which I really liked. A little bit of like credibility, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah it wasn't wasn't just generic wrestler number two, and it's not just another challenger for her. It kind of gave exactly. her something. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, they shake hands, and Julia tries to immediately pull her in for the backdrop driver, but Adora avoids it. So they shake hands again, and they get in each other's face again. It's a lot of tension off the handshakes early on. I thought it was pretty good. Uh, Chain wrestling around early. uh, Standing crucifix hold by Julia. But uh, Dora reverses into the air to an air raid crash stretch. She pulls her down, like stretches her in an air raid crash. Looked phenomenal. A uh, huge backbreaker across the knee by by Dora. Um, the training strikes. Julia uh, pulls a knee bar out of nowhere and transitions into the SCF. But Adora gets to the ropes pretty quickly. Uh, Germans are traded back and forth. Julia hits the backdrop driver. Then uh, Adora snaps the arm down and hits a senton to the back. Uh, Dora. <laughs> my favorite spot for Adora in this match picks her up, hits a goddamn bubba bomb. I haven't seen one of those in years. The the full Nelson lift up full Nelson and drop them on their tailbone. Oh, I I was and and, and Veda called it a bubble bomb, which made me ha- me so happy. I'm like I was like that's a bubble bomb, and she goes she hits her with a bubble bomb, and I'm like oh my god, she called it. <laughs> Every time you say bubba. <laughs> I'm hearing bubble. <laughs> bubble bomb, bubble bomb, bubble what? bomb. It's like a SpongeBob move. What? Yeah. It is not SpongeBob. So from the, and then from the bubble bomb, she trans ish transitions into the cattle mutilation. Uh, but Julia, the Danielson special, the Brian Danielson special, right there. But Julia gets to the ropes and she rolls to the floor. Huge power slam on the floor by Adora. Uh, Julia ends up running uh, Adora into the barricade. Uh, Adora cuts her off up top. They fight up on the top rope, but Julia hits the super butterfly suplex off the top for two. She hits the knee to the face. Adora comes back with a big boot, but Julia hits that like wild swinging baseball style punch, the baseball throw style punch that she does. And then she hits the Northern Lights bomb and she gets the win. Absolutely tremendous match. They shake hands after Dude, I just that this, this was stellar. These two women killed it. 13 minutes and two seconds. Just so good. Yeah, I noticed this one was a, a little lengthy, which I was happy about. Cause um sometimes the, the women's matches they don't get too much time. So it was nice to have a, a really good uh, amount of time on here. Um yeah, the in the beginning there, Julia was really trying to work those transitions, which we've seen her working a lot, especially with these power wrestlers. And Trisha Dora is definitely a power wrestler, but she definitely scouted a lot of those moves. And she kind of had an answer for a lot of what Julia um, was feeding her at the beginning there. Um, what I really enjoyed the most about this, despite her being a power kind of styled wrestler, 
it wasn't the same kind of power as like someone like Micah or someone like Lady C or someone like Hanako or someone like Megan Bain. It was a completely different, unique moveset all on its own, which was really fun to watch Julia try to figure out how to compensate for. Um, I really enjoy that style of, of Adora, that interesting kind of power transition move. I really did enjoy that. I didn't know that that's what it was called, that air raid style submission that she did. Um, really, really liked that. Because at first I thought that she was just dropping her. And I'm like, why is she wiggling? Why is she still standing there? And I'm like, oh, she's turning. She's, oh, she's showing off. She's gloating. I love it. Um, the look of Trisha Dora also very, very nice. I like the brighter colors with her darker skin tone. It makes everything just pop so nicely. It's a nice kind of, what's the word? It's not coming to me right now, but it, it's a very, uh, no, It'll come to me like at 3 a.m. and I'll like send you a voicemail like half awake of this is what I meant. Um, but like the pop of the white eyeliner was just so great. Um, these women also wearing their best gear. I mean, Julia's jacket, just phenomenal. Again, I hope to see that styling follow her if we are losing her and she's coming over to the North American scene for a while. Don't take away her jackets, please. Let her keep her stuff. But overall, yeah. this was a phenomenal match. Um, really, really liking the fighting champion spirit that Julia has been kind of putting forward since moving this title. And in moving this title, winning this title. Um, and I'm hoping that to see this fighting champion keep going until she is leaving the company. I, I kind of would like to see it like her kind of like lose it on her last match kind of thing. Because this is the champion who's elevating this championship specifically, even over the world championship in stardom. And arguably she's made it more important than the IWGP women's championship. Mm -hmm. She's fought with this thing more and more publicly than mm -hmm. anybody else has in stardom which I hope we see change this year because we need another historic crossover show mm -hmm. to showcase these ladies. Well, and, and something I didn't even mention, Tom, this is where Tom Lawler joined commentary. So, it, so I think it was this match where he joined commentary and he's talking about Julia and mentioning Siri and other things, which I really did like because he teamed up with Siri to face Julia and Zach at that at the historic crossover. So I liked that he was talking and about- And he got beat up by Siri and Julia. Yeah, so I I like that he was making the comments in there. There's that commercial, there's that the familiarity there with him in there. I literally did like that. But we move on. It's a tag team match. It's oh wait end. wait wait. Don't you want to talk about what happened in between this? Oh yes yes yes. So before yeah okay before we jump to the tag team match, uh, we got a video on the Tron. Uh, Mustafa Ali, uh, the the man who was released from WWE last September, uh, appears on the Tron and he challenges. The man Haromu Takahashi uh, to a match for Windy City Riot in Mustafa's home of Chicago, Illinois, on April twelfth. So, like, Mustafa's challenging Haromu to come to his turf to face him at Windy City Riot. Like, he's going to where Mustafa leaves home of Chicago, Illinois. I'm excited, and that's going to be. A Good match. This dude's on a tour, and I'm really hoping a certain local promoter named uh, Spencer can uh, book this man in sometime soon because I want to see Mustafa Ali in LPW or even if a guy named Harlan wants to book him in uh, Top Talent. I'm fine with that, too. I was more excited for this than I was for Jack Perry's review or mm -hmm. reveal. That's Dance for damn sure. Um, but yeah, um, I'm actually really excited. I was actually a little like offended at first, but then I was like, oh no, he's right. When he's going on about Hiromo, how Hiromo has failed the company, how he's kind of like not done anything right by the company. And I'm like, well, 
he's kind of done everything he can in that company right now. I, I couldn't disagree with him. So I think that this might be the match that, you know, helps Mustafa past his his WWE departure, but also help Hiromu um, kind of evolve this year. I think this is one step in the evolution of what we're going to see um, with Hiromu Takahashi this year. And uh, yeah, if you guys want to go check out that promo, please do. It was a great promo. Like, it's mm-hmm. nice to see that emotion and just the detail. You could tell he put a lot of thought and a lot of research into the things that he said before saying them. He wasn't just kind of going off the fly. He had a lot of stuff to back stuff up about what Hiromu was doing, what his gimmicks have been, the things he's done. Um, Yeah, very, very good promo. I'm excited for this. Yeah, again, it's like... I like Mustafa Ali. I, he, this is a character he was developing in WWE, trying to get it on screen, but they never went with the character. And I really like it. I'm, I'm excited to see who this what this guy does. I want to see him here in Alberta. I really do. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I can't wait to see that to see that match. Oh, so you're gonna tear it down, man. Could you imagine Mustafa Ali versus Son of Irish? Mm, please. Please, God, Holy please. Shit. Mm. That That'd would be, be awesome. money. Mm-hmm. Straight up right. money. Well, we're going to move on. It's a tag team match. It's TMDK's Bad Dude Tito and Zack Sabre Jr. taking on Matt Riddle in the blank space. Um, the Big Teats. Big Teats is back. Um, the mystery partner is revealed to be uh, Riddle's old chosen bros partner. Je- United Empire's Jeff Cobb. Um, Lawler on commentary on, in this match made a lot of sense because he, both him and Riddle have had a very similar career in going from the UFC into re- into pro wrestling. So I like I like that little – he can speak to Riddle's kind of style a little more in who, what he is background. Um, good wrestling match. Riddle and Sabre, uh, their technical wrestling together throughout the match was very good because Riddle – for what he was in WWE, he's underrated in how good he is as a technical wrestler from his time as an actual UFC fighter and the wrestling training he's he has. Um, so, like, very good with those two rolling around. A beautiful assisted floating bro by Cobb and Riddle for one, a one count. Uh, there is a beautiful saber neck snap next to the rope while uh, Big Teats does the Eddie Guerrero senton over the top combo. Really good. Love that. Um Saber starts snapping the toes of Riddle because he doesn't wear boots. And the crowd starts chanting, you sick fuck, you sick fuck. I was just like, that's awesome. Um, Cobb runs Saber into the corner on the guillotine attempt. Looked really good, just crushing him in the corner. Uh, Saber turns the tour of the islands into the crucifix for two. Um, uh, Riddle in with kicks, it strikes to Teats. But Teats gets an enziguri and a harsh German. Uh, Cobb pulls Saber off the apron and gets, uh, but he but Saber ends up pulling a rear naked choke on the floor and Teets hits a blue thunder bomb in the ring to Riddle for two, floating bro off the tops to Teets. Saber and Zach trade holds. Saber catches the kick into the ankle lock, but Cobb gets him up and tosses. Uh, like Cobb breaks that up and picks up Saber and tosses him into a, throws him off his shoulder into a kick by Riddle. Teets gets German by Cobb. But uh, he comes back, hits an exploder to Cobb right back. Riddle, and they both ro- end up rolling out. Riddle hits the, or sorry, yeah. Riddle hits the rip knee, hits the bro Derek, and he gets the win. I think it was, yeah, it was on Big Teats for the win. Again, really good match. Um, I think it was, Riddle needed this to kind of re- get him kind of back on the scene, I guess. Because he's going to be, he's, I know he's challenging Tanahashi for the, the TV title. He's got a lot of stuff coming up in the next little bit. Yeah, with uh, with this one, I, I this was honestly, despite having big teats in this one, who's one of my favorite wrestlers right now, um, I was actually not excited to see this one too much. Not a really big Riddle fan, and I wasn't particularly excited once I saw Cobb 
knowing even though that they have history, I was like, Ugh. because immediately my head went, so does that mean he's going to start to get chummy chummy with United Empire? Because no, thank you. you can stay over there on your side of the fence, sir. You don't want, um, you don't want the bro United Empire? That is sacrilege. <laughs> you deserve to be whipped and flayed for that. Oh, no, no, no. They can be the oh. bro. They, they can be the bro United Empire. You're fired. <laughs> what the hell? Ugh. Yeah, it, the, the no shoes thing, again, it's been, a, it was a concern for me for Bailey. It was a concern for me for other people. It was a concern for me for Alex Zane when he was doing commentary. He was just taking his shoes off at ringside. You never know who's going to yeet themselves under your feet. People are rude. I'm going to have to roll bare feet at your place next time we hang out. <laughs> I mean, that would be a personal choice of yours. It's too cold for me to even be doing that. Um, yeah, I, I was really happy to see Cobb, though. Um, I do enjoy watching Cobb wrestle. I just wasn't the biggest fan of his partner. Um, that being said, though, the match itself was actually very solid. Um, I really enjoyed that that combo that you had mentioned, the neck twist with the Eddie Guerrero sent on. That was actually one of the only things that I noted that I actually really liked. Um, yeah, I'm always happy to see big teeth. I really enjoyed him squaring off with Cobb. It's not very often that somebody gets Cobb off their off his feet and mm. and lifted and and dropped on him. And he definitely dropped Cobb on his shoulder really, <laughs> really nastily in this one. Um, disappointed with the result, but the overall ride was enjoyable. Mm. So kind of evens out for me, I guess. I, I think everybody loves big teats. Come on. Everybody wants to see some big teats. <laughs> Oh, yeah. he's, he's great he's a great wrestler come on yes, he is he's a fantastic wrestler so we move on to the match for the american triple crown for the AEW continental title the new japan strong open way title and the roh world title it's eddie kingston versus defending his titles against gabe kid veda says kid does not give a shit about the other two titles. He just wants a strong title. But he's getting all three in this match because Eddie's going around. He's defending it as a triple crown, which I, I'm fine with. <laughs> defend them all three. I don't care as long as you're defending them. And in what turned out to be a very good match uh, between these two because they, this match was very much about beat the living piss out of the other, in my personal opinion. Uh, they The kid attacks Eddie on the apron. They're brawling up the ramp, uh, backdrop on the ramp. They're just beating the piss out of each other on the floor. Uh, trading hard chops back and forth in each other in the ring, and he getting t uh, hitting a t bone suplex. Gets the machine gun chops in the corner. Kids fighting back forearm strikes. Gets a brain buster. He stands up. He's like walking around the ring with his arms up. The child's just chanting "fuck you, kid, fuck you, kid, fuck." It was, dude. It was great. Um, just these two just going back and forth, man. The the half and half by Eddie, and he gets a back beautiful back fist for two. Uh, kid reverses the Northern Light Bomb to a backdrop driver, hits a tombstone for two. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, kid and Eddie running head first each other. This is where those like, oh, they start head butting each other. It's just gross. Um, they're trading chops and strike, just, just going back and forth. And he gets uh, an exploder, um, clipping the apron on the floor. They're like, they're fighting on the floor. Um, and the train strikes. He gets the exploder like clip, and like kid clips the apron as he go as he goes over. Look, just rough as hell. Um, kid, like Eddie's going to get back in, and kid calls Eddie a bitch, and and is that like the count's at like sixteen right now? So Eddie comes back, he starts wailing on kid. The kid, they both get counted out. Um, Jaff are trying to tear the two apart. They're breaking out and fighting each other. He gets a hold of the, the AEW Continental title and like hucks it across the hucks it across the ring. Um, 
the war the the war dogs jump Eddie. Uh, the boos are just getting louder and louder. This is Connors and Coglin out here. A uh, kid ends up pile driving Eddie onto the Continental Crown, the Continental Title. Like, dude, there's AW Continental Crown, whatever it's called. Yeah, dude, it was crazy. Glorious, was- glorious chaos. Yes, glorious chaos. <laughs> yeah, this uh, this one I didn't have a ton of expectations for, and it actually like actually was really really good i expected to like this match the least um just because i i knew that it would just be such straight up violence but it actually was like pretty controlled violence considering that you involved um it wasn't grotesque like some matches have been it was straight up as you said these guys just trying to kick the shit out of each other um, and a good chunk of that shit kickery happened like before the match even started on the outside. Um, cause it took them a good couple minutes to get them into the ring to start the match officially. Um, yeah, the, the chops though were just, mm, just, I expect the chops out of Kingston. I expect a different kind of chop usually out of kid. He's more of a thud chopper than a clap chopper but holy heck the noise he was getting off of kingston tonight well this night i watched this match like a couple hours ago (laughs) but um yeah the the chops were so clappy so loud but they were so like landing every single one as hard as the last there's some point where they like some people will start doing it and it's just kind of like we this was no we this was not a good time this was every single chop you were getting was acting like a cpr thrust in your chest was not fun um there was one point as the the match was starting to dissolve down and and before it went to the outside for that final count out uh, that they were just hitting each other for the sake of hitting each other um this was when i started to enjoy it a little less there was less organization in there um and i was just kind of like okay we're gonna brawl to the end let's get it done then um i do like how the war dogs are getting involved in everybody else's matches though um it despite it being you know obviously annoying to some extent it's a heel thing to do and it's a bullet club heel thing to do. But at least it's not House of Torture. This is actually stuff that makes sense. This is stuff that actually works. And it's not obnoxious or predictable like House of Torture always is. Mm-hmm. It, it's spontaneous and chaotic and turns into something actually really, really good. And this is something that I think that uh, NJPW has done very well with the War Dogs. Yeah, again, it it's it's how they're building, and this isn't over. I think Windy City, I think it's gonna be Windy City Riot. We're gonna get these two for the Triple Crown again, the American Triple Crown again. I th- I I think so, and I'm, I'm not against it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm I'm looking to see what I'm looking forward to seeing what's next for these two because I I want to see them come back together because this one, I, while I expect it to be a good hard hitting match, it really really stood out to me on this show. So we move on to a match I had zero expectation for because I'm not the biggest Moxie fan. And when you know there's a Neil disqualification um, piece on it, you're like, oh, Moxie's going to bleed. But it was better than I expected it to be because I think these two still worked a really good match. Lots of brawling. They have a kendo stick, like, lightsaber fight <laughs> early on. They end up having a, a, a steel chair lightsaber fight later in the match. Uh, um, uh, Moxie's punching Shingo with his wrist, fist wrapped in chain. Uh, Takagi would do that later to Moxley. Again, like they're just beating the crap at each other. Um, 
<laughs> Shingo stops at one point and like fixes his belt. Like as he's beating up on Moxley, stops, fix, retightens his belt, and then keeps beating up on Moxley. It was like that's that's just a gangster move of like I I I'm I can I'm I'm beating you up so much I can stop and fix my belt and then I'll keep beating you up. I was like that <laughs> so good. He also prevents a wardrobe malfunction. Just saying, it's true. Uh, Mox ends up hitting Shingo with the garbage can lid, and Shingo gets busted open first. Like, who expected that? Um, he, like, there's so many different great spots here. Takagi is just hitting his lariats over and over and gets just trying to just destroy Moxley's head. Um, Mox bites the bloody forehead of Shingo, and I'm like, ew, just ew, dude. Like, uh, don't you put it in your mouth. Don't you put it in your mouth. Don't stuff it in your face. So or like, someone's just, face. Gross. So there was two spots where, like, the, with the, er, the initial kendo stick lightsaber battle, Mox ended up shoving the kendo stick in Shinkagatagi's mouth in just the weirdest way. And I'm like, this is weird. But then he... So what he did was he broke it in half. No, 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 no. That's, that's the second time. Because when the, after the little lightsaber battle against the barricade, he just shoved the end of the kendo stick in his mouth, like it was like he was Ew, trying to make what? him like like fo- oh, make him fillet. He, the... he did. But then they he broke the kendo stick later and like takes the shards, starts stabbing them into the forehead, and then he shoves the pieces he's been stabbing him with in his mouth, and I'm like, ew. Like, so the question just... is, what is Moxley's obsession with sticking things in his mouth? And other people's mouths. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, Mox gets hit in the head with a, with a trash can lid, and he starts bleeding. They're just beating the living piss out of each other. They do the chair duel. Uh, Takagi hits Mox in the abdomen and hit, or he he wraps his arm in the chain and hits a lariat with the chain around his arm. He gets a two out of that. There's a table spot. Mox ends up putting Shingo through a table with the elbow drop. Um, they get a table in the ring. Uh, uh, Mo- um, Takagi ends up missing Moxley up top, hits a DVD off the top through the table. It's the death Valley driver. Um, hits the pumping bomber, hits a straight jacket power bomb for two, then made in Japan for two. They're brawling. Mox hits a cutter, the stomp, the death rider, but Shingo to cut. And I'm like, please don't end it like this. And Shingo kicks out a 2.9. I'm like, oh, thank you, Chris. That if he would have just come out of what taking all those moves just to hit that shit, I would have been a little mad. So Moss gets him in, hits the hammer and anvil elbow drops to the neck that all the that all the members of BCC do. Um, applies the Renika choke. Takagi stands up. Uh, Mox hits him with a sleeper suplex. Mox hits a lariat, hits a death rider through a setup chair. And he finally gets the win at like 26 and a half minutes. While not my favorite style of professional wrestling, these two did a great job in giving and Moxley bled, Chicago bled, but they didn't bleed that like pouring out of them blood. They bled a bit and that was it. I really enjoyed it because it's just these two dudes just beating the living piss out of each other. Again, just like the match before. But they did it in their style, and it was just it worked. It I, it was the first Moxley blood match in a long while that I've actually enjoyed. Other than the other than the triple threat. Yeah, I was gonna say other than that triple threat, this was another one with him where the injury and the blood made sense. But this was the first time in a long time that it was a John Moxley match that involved weapons, where like. He did not have the crimson mask the entire time. He did have it for a little bit once he initially got busted open, but it clearly cauterized itself and 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 he was kind of pretty clear by the uh, the end of it, even with the misting. Um, and there was a moment I, I sent you a video of what, of what I thought of what was happening with the kendo stick and the chair battle. And subsequently, the the table pieces, it brought back memories to me of Robin Hood men in tights, where Little John and Robin Hood were like having their little stick battle on on the bridge. And every time they like hit it at the right spot, the stick breaks in half and they discard a piece and use the littler piece. 
Um, that was all I could think about when I saw those. And it actually happened when Shingo was hitting Moxley with the, the remaining pieces of the table that were in the ring. He hit him with one piece. It broke into two. He tossed one piece and he hit it with another. And that piece also broke. And I was like, oh my God, he's doing it. He's going to do it. But no, he ended up hitting him with that inside out pumping bomber lariat. I've never, I, ha I can't recall seeing Moxley sell an inside out in quite some time. Um, yeah, but then not, I, mean, I also don't watch his stuff a lot. So I don't know if he does them. No, he doesn't really do that flippy dippy like that. Like yeah. he doesn't need to take it inside out. So for him to do it inside out means they're really selling how powerful that Takagi Lariat mm -hmm. is. And yeah, I mean, but, former yeah. IWGP World Champion, obvious. Mm -hmm. um, I think I figured out what I don't like about Moxley. Now that I figured it out. I can kind of focus on trying to get past it. He was not, his selling is what bothers me. It's very lazy. Mm. You're wrestling a former IWGP world champion. Don't be lazy. That being said, though, Takagi makes you work mm. when he wants to. So he would allow Mox to be as lazy as he would want to be. But there were moments, especially when the match was getting into the 20 minutes mark and it was, they were clearly a little tired, obvious 20 minute match. Um, well, 26 minutes, as you said, uh, subsequently. Um, yeah, that the kendo stick in the mouth was gross. I just did not like that. Uh, don't put it in your mouth. I keep saying it. Don't you put it in your mouth. Don't you put it in your mouth. Don't stuff it in your face. Don't. Anyway, um, I'm also a lot more comfortable with table spots in North America than I am in Japan. Just because that, that absence of that metal frame around the, the rest of the wood of the table. Oh, Would you yeah. <laughs> when when Takagi went through there, I I wasn't having a mild panic attack like I was when I saw Hikaleo, you know. So it it yeah, I don't like table spots in Japan. Let's avoid them unless you want to look like Coughlin. That that's a different thing entirely. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the the table speed yeah. There's just a lot of fun, a lot of chaos in this match. But again, I'm also not a hardcore, no DQ, deathmatch person, despite Suzu Suzuki, who is a deathmatch specialist, being one of my favorite wrestlers. Um, however, this match was surprisingly palatable for me. Um, it, I wouldn't say, oh my God, go out and you have to watch this. But I wouldn't say avoid it if it's on your match watch list if it's on your watch list watch it because it'd be worth it you'll have a good trip but like if you're not into to hardcore matches i'd even still recommend putting it in a, a top 10 mm -hmm. watch because again it was very palatable considering what it was and who was involved in it and with takagi in it it could have been a lot more bloody and a lot more chaotic but mm -hmm. i think having this kind takagi here was what kept everything on the the level and kept mm -hmm. it nice for viewership. Yeah, I'm not going to put this on a match of the year list, but I had a great time watching this match. I had fun. But talking of a match of the year list, um, this one's on my list. Fuck, 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 fuck. This was good. Uh, Kazuchika Okada versus Will Ospreay. Um, the going to be the last singles match uh, Will Ospreay will have under, under his New Japan contract. He has one more match that is February 11th when he faces the War Dogs in that 10-man steel cage match. Um, yeah, this is the perfect final singles match for this man, getting to face the man who brought the man who brought him to New Japan in, in Kazuchika Okada. Um, 
Yeah, let's get his uh, ole, ole, ole chance for the match starts. Okada chance start right after the bell is ringing. This is awesome chance of ringing up before they even lock up. This crowd is ready for this. They, they spend the first few minutes feeling each other out, trying to get the dominant position. That's like the first few minutes. That's how the, these two work. It's how kind of Okada works early. Um, they're, they're, uh, Osprey goes for his plancha to the floor, but he misses and Okada DDTs him on the floor. And then he gets the apron hung DDT. Um, there's let's go Osprey. Let's, uh, and then let's go Osprey. Okada, a chance springing out. Um, Okada gets the corner splash, but as he goes for another move, Osprey hits a suplex. Osprey falls with a hamstring flip kick and then he, and sending Okada to the floor and finally gets his plancha. Um, Okada in the ring gets a flapjack and then hits an air raid crash neckbreaker, gets the money clip, but Osprey gets out of it by running Okada into the corner. Um, two huge hook kicks, Os cutter, and but he but Osprey can only get two. Uh, Okada avoids sky twister and hits a shotgun drop kick. Uh, Okada hits a tombstone on the floor. Um, beautiful hook kick, but the Os cutter gets blocked and Osprey, uh, uh and Okada goes for the Rainmaker, but Osprey reverses it into a Spanish fly. Um, yeah, uh, uh, Rainmaker again is attempted, but it's reversed into a roll up, then turned into a Styles Clash by Osprey, but can only get two. Um, Osprey, Okada's against the ropes. Osprey does the Kenny Omega like finger gun thing, like to, to, to for the V trigger, but Okada cuts him off the drop kick, hits, uh, hits uh, the Rainmaker gets reversed. But Okada, uh, Osprey goes for a Rainmaker, but Okada reverses into a Stormbreaker. It's a Stormbreaker. Then Okada hits Rainmaker, but Osprey kicks it out at 2.9. This is where Okada gets up and flips off the crowd. And this place just proceeds to boo him. Like, they're like, what the fuck, dude? We're too- Half of us are cheering for you. It just, this match is going insane. Um, Osprey reverses, like, uh, kind of goes for the dropkick, but Osprey catches him and power bombs him. Um, they're trading strikes to the knees. They rise. They're trading strikes. Okada uh, eventually drops Osprey. The, the announcer says 25 minutes. And I'm like, this has been 25 minutes? What the fuck? Um, and I just watched this about two hours ago. Um, or couple hours a few hours ago um hidden blade out of nowhere to the face osprey calls for rainmaker but he gets drop kicked and then the rainmaker and uh or he get he gets a drop kick and then gets a rainmaker and only gets two um osprey reverses the okada attempted rainmaker into stormbreaker okada kicks a 2.9 hidden blade is reversed or is dodge and okada hits the drop kick then the emerald flosion he gets the wrist clutch. He's, they're trading strikes. Okada hits like a short arm lariat, hits a Death Valley driver, picks up Ospreaker, uh, Osprey, Rainmaker, and the and Okada wins the match. Uh, like, I think it's the perfect ending because everybody knows Osprey's leaving. Nobody knows what the fuck Okada's doing. They don't know if he's re-signed and saying nobody knows. So having the guy that's is the one that should be staying win this match made so much sense. And it's not like there isn't another forbidden door out there. It's not like there's not a chance these two couldn't go again. So man, as his, as Osprey's final singles match, this was absolutely incredible. Before we get to the post-match, I'm going to let you talk about the match before we get to post-match stuff. Yeah. Cause there was some, some more glorious, glorious chaos in the post too. Was uh, an interesting, uh, show and a freaking phenomenal match to to end the show with um the last uh, the last show no that wasn't an osprey ender either but we could have we could have ended with osprey holy mm-hmm. heck um i mean it's these are the top two money guys in new japan right now we're losing one of them potentially losing a second um we don't know, as you mentioned, what Okada is doing. Um, but yeah, this match was very interesting. We we kind of saw, we're seeing with Okada the emergence of this kind of interesting, stoically cold personality. Where like, he's not going out of his way to be a dick or anything. But he's certainly not going out of his way to be nice 
either. Yeah. He's kind of, dare I say, nightwing it right now. He's walking that line of good and evil. Sometimes he veers off into the good and he's like super duper good Okada. And then sometimes he veers off and we see him do some cheap shots on the outside and then just kind of walk away like, yeah, I just did that. What you going to do about it? <laughs> the the evil in more more ways than one. <laughs> I would rather not <laughs> compare it. He's not doing shenanigans though. No, no, no. He's not he and he's not being obnoxious about it either. He's being very, I don't want to say arrogant about it, but he's certainly walking with a little bit more of a confidence mm -hmm. in his step. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, this I mean, what else can I add on there? You took a lot of the great <laughs> a lot of the stuff on the outside was very concerning i mean it's osprey i'm always gonna let you have osprey you you yeah. you and you say i'm the sex pig well you are i mean but so are you i don't want to sleep with him i'm just a big fan of him. <laughs> you just, no i'm afraid of his woman um <laughs> Yeah, this match was just the perfect way to end this show and the perfect way to kind of, as you said, kind of peter out the tail end of, of Osprey's kind of career here. His last singles match in NJPW for now. Hmm. For now. Um, well, and, back. and he even said, as a contracted wrestler, the commentary said this is his final singles of the contracted wrestler. <coughs> He was saying it's it, there. Everything was stated as a contracted wrestler because there's there's always a chance he comes back for another match while working with AEW. It, it, it's going to happen. We all know it will. Well, yeah. I mean, the talents will just and as I mentioned, and we've mentioned, both of us have mentioned multiple times on multiple shows. It can only benefit both companies to have that go back and forth between. AEW and NJPW and mm -hmm. ROH and Impact. Hell, even WWE. Like it just it benefits everybody to have that mm -hmm. avenue of talent and communication going back and forth. So yeah, it, it's probably not the last time we're gonna see these two in the ring, but it, it certainly they had a very emotional bout. And the, the little promo that they put on beforehand where it showed the all the wins. Yeah, between these guys in their one on ones, it just mm, it set the stage for something so great. But that's what Osprey is really, really known for. For me, is his just endless ability to create a story and create something by just opening his mouth. Mm -hmm. That's all he does. It's crazy. Yeah, and even that video it showed. It showed the Rev Pro match where Okada first wrestled Osprey, and then it shows the little promo backstage at a New Japan show that's of Okada thanking him for bringing him in, and then showing the history of these two. It just is it was a beautiful, touching thing to watch. You know what I mean? Just because like they've been through a lot together, like, and then him turning on, on Okada and forming the Empire and so many things. So. We get the handshake and hug after the match, and this is where the war dogs come out. They toss Okada out pretty much immediately. They're beating down on Osprey. Uh, Finley's getting ready to Finley's getting ready to hit him with a shillelagh. Uh, but Cobb, TJP, and to everybody's surprise, Eddie Kingston come out to make the save, but not really surprised because Eddie Kingston is in a bit of a war with Kid anyways, so it makes sense. Um, they, they make the save. Eddie tries to hit Coglin with a ring bell. Misses. It was He's funny. lucky he moved too, because Kingston full on swung with that thing. Mm -hmm. Um, and so they they clear the ring. War dogs leave. The crowd starts chanting, "Thank you, Osprey." Uh, Will says, "You can thank me after I wipe the floor with war dogs." Uh, Finley, you and your sex slaves can keep running around doing whatever. We'll see you in Osaka. Oi, Eddie, I owe you one. So because again, and I, I can't wait because I want to see how they interact in AEW. See what they do together in AEW. I would like to see a match between the two of them, honestly, on one of the AEW shows for the Triple I mean, Crown. being that Kingston is a champion, 
we've got Moody Broody Osprey. Moody Broody Osprey equals championships. So I would assume that they are probably going to be introducing themselves to each other very, very quickly when uh, Osprey arrives in the AEW locker room for sure. Yeah. Um, in regards to Kingston just kind of coming out there, I don't know if it was more of a, I think you're right. It's more of a, he's in a feud with kid thing. Mm. I don't think it was a, Oh, I got the United empires back. No, it yeah. was definitely a moment of, I can get in here and fight a little bit more. Mm -hmm. tonight. Definitely and, that. Yeah. So Will Osprey says, "Thanks for having my back, boys. Love you." Hogs, uh, Cobb, and Kid, or Cobb and TJP, who just we ended up going sitting in the corner for the promo. Uh, the Os, thank you, Osprey. Chance go again. He says, "On a serious, serious note, thank you." Uh, to, he says, "Thank you to the fans. It's been a really fun year." He came in at 22 years old. Found out a lot about himself here. Uh, they allowed an immature man to face everyone here and grow from it. And then the crowd just starts chanting, oh, spray, oh, spray. Uh, he thanks Okada. He thanks the fans. He said, it's a, a, not too bad for a little autistic kid from Essex. Um, he says he's grateful to evolve and grow under the lion's mark. Um, he's grateful for his boys in the Empire since they formed in day one. Uh, funny that not, that, o that Okan's not there, though. <laughs> And Okan's not even in the not even in the ten man tag, which is the even funnier part. Um, uh, this chapter, yeah, it's the it's the other five members that are in that are in that. Uh, it's uh, the the two juniors, uh, Cobb, Hanare, and Osprey that are in that match because it's two juniors versus three heavyweights. That makes yeah. no sense. It 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 should be, in my opinion, it should be Hanare and Okan in there instead of Cobb. But yeah, I agree. But it is, it is what it is. Um, he says this chapter is closing. Another one, another is opening. One more date on February 11th, and we're bringing the steel cage. He started as a backyard wrestler, and he's bringing it to New Japan. Uh, if you don't like violence, and he lists off like don't like blood and all this shit, don't watch. But if you're sick like I am. Let's take that piss out of Bullet Club and bury it. Like he wants to destroy Bullet Club at the point. <laughs> I like how you you censored him there. Yes, <laughs> we haven't been censoring ourselves. <laughs> okay, but... and fucking bury it. Okay, <laughs> wants to fucking bury it. <laughs> yeah, he had he had some choice words, and I just kind of laughed. I'm like, yep, yep, this is still NJPW television where you can get away with that <laughs> um aew might not be so coolio with the f-bombs i don't even know how coolio they'll be with the sex pig thing but <laughs> yeah, i have hope don't be a bitch tony well we have come to the end of another episode of NJBW Pure All the Review. If you're if you're listening on that Sunday's main event, thank you so very much for joining us here. Uh, subscribe to the channel at Sunday's Main Event Radio .com. And if you're watching on our YouTube page or on uh, my on the Backbreaker Video YouTube page, please go down, like the video, subscribe to the channel, uh, comment down below. Uh, please hit the uh, the uh, notification button so you can learn every time we drop a new video. Ding dong. Hello. But you can find me on the X Mastodon Blue Sky and Hive at that Canada guy. TikTok, Instagram, and threads at that Canada dude. You can find me on Facebook at Andre and Melball Wrestling Talk over there. And you can always find me right here on the YouTube page, uh, youtube.com slash at Andre and Melball Wrestling Talk. You can find us all the time. You can find us on our big shows over at Sunday Night's Main Event.com on an audio form. Please check them out. Lots of great content over there. They cover uh, they cover everything across where they cover MLW, WWE, NXT. We cover Japanese wrestling for them now. They cover, they cover AEW. It's all covered over there. So please go check them out over there. If you want to support them, go to patreon.com slash SNME radio. Give them a couple of dollar dues and you can support some great content. And they got some new special content coming out this year exclusively for their Patreon members. You can also find me over at twitch.tv slash at 
our local establishment uh, to on Thursday. We're going to be doing our live review of the Echo series. Um, I've got some choice uh, opinions on how I feel about that series. Uh, some good, some bad. You 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 would hear it all over there. Myself and old Ed on Marvel Talk, and then later this month we'll be having our Marvel Talk Rebound coming out with our review of the Incredible Hulk. Going back to the, we're going back. We got the second second movie, and I I still haven't watched it because I don't want to watch that goddamn shithole of a movie, but I'm going to at some point. You can also find us over at youtube.com slash at Backbreaker Video. Go over there, support Mike the Red. Lots of great content going over there, going on over there on his wrestling channel. There's us, you know, there's stuff from Astrid and other people over there. Please check that out. Uh, you can also go over to twitch.tv slash Mike the Ref. See all this great uh, gaming content, live gaming content that he does there. His AEW watch along that he does every Wednesday. Uh, it's it's going to be starting in a few minutes here as we're finishing this one up. Uh, you can also go over to youtube.com slash at Backbreaker Gaming for all the replays of his great gaming content. We can find him, Mr. PJC, Mr. Rick Jules, who we're going to see both those men this coming weekend at the hockey game. And their wonderful uh, special guest, Miss Kayla J. Kayla J. I love Kayla J. Yes, you do. Melba, where can they find you? If you're wanting to follow a Melba, you can follow her on the X thing at Collins Melba. You can follow her on everything else Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Mastodon, and Blue Sky at Melba Collins. You can also find me on our local establishments programming soon where I'm going to be doing a show called Spooky Okey Ish where we talk about shit on the internet that's really spooky and try to figure out if it's real or if it's an elaborate hoax by someone who's just really good at Photoshop and has too much time on their hands. It's all a hoax. <laughs> It's always a hoax. <laughs> you can also catch me on Astro Pizarro's YouTube channel where we do our show, Ladies Wrestling Showcase. We're going to be having an episode this week. I'm so excited. We're going to talk about some of the stuff happening in women's wrestling. So you'll want to check it out. If you're wanting to watch NJPW, we will leave a link in the description box below. It is njpwworld.com. It is 999 yen or approximately $10 Canadian. Shout out Sean Spears. But it's more like nan fitty, according to that guy over there. Sort of inflation. It's a thing. It's still an incredible price to watch some amazing wrestling. You can go in there and watch the show that we are talking about today in Japanese. Unless you go to fight where you can see it in English, but you have to pay more. So we do it. Well, I did it in Japanese, <laughs> but you can go and watch that show. You can go and watch last year's Battle in the Valley, which was just as awesome of a show. You can go back onto our website and check our review on that one. If you don't believe us, Andre, my trusted friend and colleague, do you have anything else to say to the beautiful people? Just thank you all so very much, and we love you. Please keep coming back. Throw the comments down below. We want to hear from you. So love you. Love you all. If you listen on SMNA Radio, throw the comments into them on the Facebook page because I'd love to hear from you guys over there. I'm on I'm on the SNME page all the time. Uh, please check, please uh, message me over there if you're listening to it. Thank you. <laughs> and that being said, I am your mama. Over there is Andre. We will see you next time. Adios. Thank you.